Hello and welcome to another Outlet at Home experience. I'm Vince Thomas, lead pastor of the Outlet Community Church, and I want to thank you for being a part of our worship experience today. Whether you're watching live, you're catching the rebroadcast, or you're listening to our audio podcast, it is my complete honor to be able to spend some time with you today. And I am just excited about the direction of this series that we've started on Easter Sunday and really the implications that it has for our lives in the coming days. I wanna encourage everyone who is under the sound of my voice today. If you have a notepad, if you have a way to take notes, or if you have access to the YouVersion Bible app, you can take notes in there. But I really want you to listen over the next three weeks. I believe that this teaching that we're going to embark on is going to not only transform your life, but most importantly, anchor your life and help give reason as to what is the significance in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? How does that apply to the life that I'm living today? I'm excited about this series because this series is what has revolutionized my life. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of his grace has really opened my eyes to realities and ways of living that I didn't think were possible, although I grew up the majority of my life inside of the church. I want to talk to those who are a part of the outlet community, whether you're a supporter, a member, a partner. I, I feel a responsibility every week to feed you the word of God with simplicity and with understanding. And I'll be honest that in this online world, there sometimes is a pressure that I place on myself to be entertaining and to say catchy things. But as I was preparing this series, the Lord really caution me that the greater good that's going to come out of our time together is that you understand what's known as the first oracles of Jesus Christ. You understand why you believe what you believe. And more importantly, not only do you understand, but that you're able to share it with those in which you have influence over. So if it's parents, you're able to answer tough questions that may come from your children about why do you believe the way that you believe? Uh, young people who are watching, there's so many different conspiracy theories that are in our earth and so many voices that try to discredit the validity of Jesus Christ. Uh, you'll be able to come back to, I believe, these notes and say, hey, I hear what you're saying, but here are the proofs in which I stand upon. You know, I was comforted as I was preparing for this message. I came across a scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 where Peter was saying, I will always remind you of these things, uh, even though you already know them and you're standing firm in the truth that you've been taught. So for those who say, hey, I understand this, I know this, guess what? A part of the outlet community, we are going to take time to go back to the basics, or as the series says, we're going to go back to base. So this series is going to help those who may have recently recommitted their life to the things of God, or maybe you're new to the Christian faith, you're going to hear some important elements that are going to help to shape and to form you in the right understanding and perspective. But for those who have been around the things of God for a while, we're going to go back and answer and redress some issues and redress some questions that you may have deep down inside so that as you're sharing the gospel with others, you can be sure that you're sharing with accuracy and not based off of what someone else passed on to you. And so with that being said, I'm going to invite you all to join me in this journey, and we're going to be looking at three opening text scriptures. Yes, that's right, three opening text scriptures. Class is in session, everyone. And if you would go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll be looking at verses 4 to 7. Uh, then we'll be going to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And then we'll be looking at Luke 24, 49 to really establish the launching pad of today's message. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 4 through 7, I want you to title this as the proof of the resurrection. You'll notice in Matthew chapter 28, after Jesus was raised from the dead, that in the, in the beginning of Matthew 28, that the Roman soldiers immediately initiated a cover-up because they didn't want word getting out that this prophet of God, this man who is known to the people of Israel as their Messiah, their king, 
has actually done what he said he was going to do. So they, there ensued a cover-up. They wanted to pay off Roman soldiers to not speak of what they experienced when the angel came and rolled back the tomb and Jesus walked out. But yet it couldn't stop the news of Jesus. And so we see 1 Corinthians, which was written by uh, Paul. It says that in verse 4, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as Scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom were still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. So if Jesus was to have risen from the dead and he began to make visits to select individuals, you all know my mind begins to ask questions about the text. You know, he could have risen from the dead and gone straight to heaven and been seated at the right hand of the Father without any other recourse here on earth. But yet he decided to show up and have times of visitation, times of teaching where he had important instructions that he wanted to pass on. And I believe that if he came back to share some instructions that they are important for us. And we see in Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20. And so in Christian environments and Christian teaching circles, you will see Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is known as the most fundamental principle of action that every person who believes in Christ should take. This is known as the great commission. So Jesus is now back. He is having in Matthew 28, one of the final statements that he's sharing to those who are in attendance before he is taken up into the clouds to, to ascend into heaven. And it says, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he said, Jesus came to and told his disciples, he said, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, speaking to the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and Holy Spirit. And I want you all to underline this phrase right here. This, this caused me to really stop and ponder for a moment. Jesus then said, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus wasn't saying that I am going to forsake you now as he was ascending, but he was saying now that I have finished the work that was prophesied for thousands of years before he came to earth to fulfill his mission, he says that, It is now time that I've risen from the dead for those who I have spent time with, those that I've spent uh, moments of teaching with, to now teach new disciples to obey all that I have commanded. Well, the question that I had was, if he's telling them to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, what are the commands that he's given us? And I want you to think about that. We're going to answer that question today. What did Jesus teach before he ascended? But what I love about Jesus is that when he gives us instruction, he gives us not only proof, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, not only has he given us a commission in Matthew 28, but he wants to make sure that we're equipped in order to do what he's asked us to do. And in Luke 24 and 49, It says, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. What I love about Jesus, he said, before I send you out, I want you to return to a time where I'll be able to pour into you. And the title of today's message is simply, Return to sender. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life of Jesus. He is our risen king. He is our risen savior. He is the one who right now sits at the right hand of the Father as the mediator between God and man, and he is actively enforcing his covenant. But Lord, we understand that faith cannot go beyond what the will of God specifically known in our lives is. And so as we build our faith, as we anchor ourselves into the teaching of your word, 
where so many things are going on in our society. Lord, show us how to practically apply what we see and what we know. Help us to return to you. Help us return to the one who has sent us. And as we do, Lord, your Holy Spirit will empower us to do what we felt was impossible before. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I want to pose a question. We're going to have a moment of trivia. And so there are some options that are coming up on screen. And the question that I want you to partake of in this trivia is, what did Jesus teach before he ascended to heaven? Now, come on. There are two items that he taught. And as you see the options right now on the screen, I want you in the comments to let me know which one you believe was his focus, which was his emphasis in his time before he ascended. It was very limited. So when someone has limited amount of time with people that they care about and those that are going to carry on their legacy, their mission, they're going to make sure that whatever they share is right on target and right on time to help them in their walk with what they're asked to do. Now, whatever Jesus taught was powerful enough to take disciples who were at one time cowardice, where we see in the story of the crucifixion of Jesus that when he was crucified, when he was beaten, even when he was on trial, Peter, one of his main disciples, was the one denying Jesus at the time that he needed to stand up and affirm his commitment to the one that had spent three years with him. As we see when Jesus was uh, crucified, the disciples then went into hiding because of fear that they too would be, would be brought and be put to shame. After all the time that Jesus said, listen, I'm going to have to be uh, put to death. I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm going to come back. Don't get afraid. Don't be worried. Let not your heart be troubled. Yet their heart was troubled. So whatever Jesus taught to them, from the time that Jesus ascended into heaven, we see the account in the book of Acts that these same disciples were now bold to declare that Jesus Christ is the king. Jesus Christ is Lord. And all of the immediate disciples were willing to be put to death now for what they heard and what they believed in. Even John, who was the disciple who was put to death, but he didn't die because he was also known as the disciple of love. He was willing to be persecuted, to be martyred for this revelation. So I ask you again, what did Jesus teach? Whatever Jesus taught, it even applied to the fuel that helped to move forward the civil rights movement. One story in particular that comes to mind is uh, in C.T. Vivian's new uh, book, It's in the Action. It was his story as a freedom writer. He said that there was just this belief, there was this calling that was attached to believing in the faith of God that they had and the power of prayer and the power of gathering and getting together. This revelation of Jesus inspired them so much so that they were willing to challenge the status quo. They were willing to challenge remnants of segregation that lasted long after segregation was outlawed. And, and there was a time where as a freedom writer, uh, C.T. Vivian and the group of people who came from uh, Nashville and those who came uh, from northern states to drive through the south, as they got into Jackson, Mississippi, they were arrested and taken into jail. And they only anticipated that it was just going to be one bus. But it was many buses of individuals with the same convictions and the same boldness who were arrested so much so that they were moved from a holding cell to the main Mississippi State Penitentiary. And C.T. Vivian writes in his story that their faith in God was so strong that even though they were locked up for challenging the status quo, they still on Sunday mornings were able to have church service. What about this revelation of Jesus will cause you to look in the face of danger and in the face of persecution in the face of at sometimes even death and says, not my life, but it's the life that I get to live because of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus teach? 
Well, let me give you some backstory before I answer that question. I'm going to leave that question out there. So when Jesus raised from the dead, and I said before, Matthew 28, you see in Scripture that there was a cover-up that ensued in order to cover up what Jesus has done. But when Jesus appeared in various places, he did two things. The first thing that he did was he restored confidence. We see the story of what's known as Doubting Thomas, where he was able to say, listen, put your hands in my wrist. Put your hand in my side. And one thing that he was able to dispel was this Gnostic belief that Jesus was just good vibes only. Jesus was beyond good vibes. Jesus was a real person who paid a real price, and he lived for people to see. But another thing that Jesus restored was fellowship between God and man. And we see that illustrated through the story of Jesus going and rescuing Peter, who felt completely despondent after he denied Jesus three times in a very critical time. I can only imagine Peter, who we see in scripture as a leader, someone who stands out and is boisterous. He was feeling completely dejected that in the time that he needed to speak up and be bold, he let God down. But Jesus showed up and said, hey, If you love me, I want you to feed my lambs. If you love me, I want you to feed my sheep. What Jesus was saying is that, yes, I know you may feel disappointed. Yes, I know you may be down, but there's still a life for you to live. You know, it amazes me to see Jesus in this light because the people that he went to restore, the people that he went to show and to prove that he was who he said he was, were those who were closest to him. You see, biblical scholarship notes that the disciples were still clueless as to Jesus' main purpose and assignment. And so we we understand now in Luke chapter 24 and 49, where Jesus said, listen, I understand your weaknesses. I understand areas where you may uh, feel like giving up or you may feel like drawing back, but I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit to help. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit to give you the words to say, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit, as it says in John chapter 14, verse 26, to bring all things that I've taught you back to your mind. And so post-resurrection, I ask you the question again, what did Jesus teach? Well, before I tell you the answer, I know I'm keeping you on the line here. Before I tell you the answer, I will say that whatever Jesus taught was the solution to two important issues that dealt with inequities among those who were in the minority, which were followers of Jesus. You see, those who were believers in the time immediately after Jesus raised from the dead were not in the majority. They were not the the ones who carried the majority of the power in two places in politics, and they didn't control the power in religion. And so there were two forms of pressure that this group of people that Jesus was helping to empower, helping to teach, giving his final instructions to, they had to go against, number one, political oppression from the expansion of the Roman Empire. So there was an issue with taxation or the raising of revenue, the raising of capital. But I want you to notice that not only did this minority have to deal with political oppression, they also had to deal with religious oppression. And religious oppression deals in areas of supremacy. How interesting are the times that they were living in when Jesus raised from the dead and the times that we're living in right now? Did you know that the majority of oppression that people of color feel in America is not necessarily only from a political sense, but it's more so from a religious sense, a religious oppression, an idea of supremacy or a supreme race? You know, as I was doing some digging into understanding the importance of our Christian faith, there was a note that came out about the origins of the nation of Islam in America. What stood out is that the nation of Islam in America was not formed because people of color wanted a different religion. The nation of Islam was formed in America out of protest to what was believed as the white man's Jesus failing people and communities of color. 
And so they said, instead of us believing in what they believed was a white Jesus that only cared about serving one particular group of people, they said, you can keep your Jesus, you can keep your religion, but we're going to find something that addresses the ills that we're facing in our communities. And so if we don't have an accurate depiction and an accurate picture of what Jesus taught, we will fall into a category of being skeptical of the efficacy of God's word and the reality and the relevance of it in our lives. So now I'm going to give you the answer. What did Jesus teach as he was ascending into heaven? Go over to Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Jesus simply said, and he told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to everyone. So that was the first thing that Jesus taught. Jesus' emphasis, number one, was on the gospel or good news. Number two, the second thing he taught was the kingdom. Now, this is interesting that Jesus is focus and his focal points were on the gospel and the kingdom. That was it. And let's see why. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to look at the gospel now from the account of Paul. And what was interesting about the gospel coming from the account of Paul is that Paul was a reformed Jewish scholar, meaning the same place of religious oppression was the same place that one of the most robust accounts of the gospel was then carried out for all of us to learn and discover today. What I also find interesting is that the second topic or the kingdom was also given to us by a Gentile, a non-disciple known as Luke, the physician. So he represented the political oppression. So the beauty of this scripture, the beauty of this gospel is that although the gospel and the kingdom were preached in order to minimize the inequities of the marginalized, Jesus then says in John 13 and 34, I want you with this gospel and with this teaching of the kingdom to still master the ability to love others the way in which I've loved you. And so what's important to understand with that is that even when it comes to Paul, Paul was one who was a part of the persecution who was a part of the beatings of those who followed Christ because they considered those who followed Christ as revolutionaries. That because of the love that was shown, even in Acts chapter 8, when they were stoning Stephen for no reason and putting him to death, and Stephen didn't take matters into his own hands, but he said, Father, into your hands I commit my soul. It made a lasting effect on Paul so much so that as he was walking to Damascus to carry on more terror, Jesus shows up. And Paul is able to see that even though he is trying to do the Lord's work, he's doing the Lord's work completely misguided. And we now have an account of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17. Paul now says, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. But the foundation of your faith the victory over eternal death and the reversal of the damage done by Adam is the true focal point of Jesus Christ. Well, let's look over at Luke's account now of the kingdom. Let's go over to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're going to go through the word of God. And again, if you're uh, new to the things of God or if you're, you're recommitting yourself to the faith, I want you to see these scriptures and to be able to write these scriptures down and see that, okay, why did Jesus focus on the gospel and the kingdom as his means of communication before he left 
the earth. Well, it says in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it's, and this is Luke speaking, he says, In my first book I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven, after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through Holy Spirit. Watch this, verse 3. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Luke says that in times past, toward the end of his first writing, which was what we have as the book of Luke, so keep a finger in Acts chapter 1 and go back to Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. And this is what Luke was meaning, and I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It says, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees, speaking of Jesus being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. So people were looking for an external sign about this kingdom. Will it be something spectacular? Will it be something that we all know? Will it be something that takes over the sky? Will, well, like, how will this kingdom come? In verse 21, he says, uh, uh, nor will they say, see here or see there. It says, for indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So, what Jesus was teaching was important to the foundation of our faith. It gives us victory over eternal death. It helps us to reverse the damage done by Adam in the Garden of Eden. But now we see that the kingdom that Jesus preached is talking about a life that's lived within us. And what that does is it shapes our character. But Jesus preaching on the gospel and the kingdom have four current implications to our life today. And quite honestly, these are going to be the four topics in which we spend the rest of the year not only teaching, but also demonstrating and making sure there's a level of mastery inside of our community. And so the gospel and the kingdom impact four different areas. The first area is our faith. It strengthens our faith, as I've said before. So we want to make sure that you're anchored and, and so that no one can confuse you. No one can, you know, knock you off of what you believe because you have a true experience with God. Number two, the gospel and the kingdom of God help to define family, both natural and spiritual family. I believe that as a church that we are to go beyond just being a church that cares about community Community means that there are many individuals who are all connected for a common purpose. But I want us to grow from being a community to ultimately growing into family. So these individual members who are coming together for a common purpose now say, if there's something wrong with my brother, there's something wrong with my sister, then I am going to be willing to help in whatever way possible to make sure that no one who is connected in my community goes without, when we could band together as a network of families and do something powerful for the kingdom of God and transform our neighborhoods, transform our jobs, transforms through things that we do in our businesses. The next area is, and this, this gets real, y'all, the understanding the gospel and the kingdom of God will help you to live a life of greater fitness, both mental and physical. And this is something that, as I began to look at it, just began to challenge me on a, on a very personal level. And as a pastor, it is important that I not just preach a happy message and just, you know, we shout and we, we talk about all these things and the word of God. And, but we don't hold each other accountable to how is our faith? How are we in family or in relationships? How is our fitness both mentally and physically? And the final area that the gospel and the kingdom of God influences is our finances. In uh, the gospels, we see Jesus saying, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. You know, all this conversation about who Jesus was and Jesus living his life here on this earth in a perfect way to satisfy the requirements of the law, 
was all for the purpose of winning our heart. And so we're going to take some time to talk about biblical stewardship, biblical finances. What does it mean to be generous? What is true biblical generosity? And I want to close with this statement that's, that's rough, but I believe that you can handle it. We aren't full disciples of Jesus Christ until we're willing to allow him to orchestrate how we steward our finances. Family, I believe that what Jesus did is so rich. I believe it's so powerful. I believe that we're living in a time where we need to go beyond just great sermons, but how do we produce transformed lives? I'm going to ask you to take this journey with me. I'm going to ask us to return to sender, go back to base, go back to the foundation so that we can be what God has called us to be in the world today. Amen. Can I pray with you? Heavenly Father, this word that we've taught, it examined what you desire to, to speak to us, what you desire to share, to leave into the earth before you ascended. It was about your gospel, and it was about the kingdom of God. And as we continue this series on next week, as we look into the gospel, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? What does it mean to have the good news? Lord, may it come alive in our hearts. But you're calling us even higher in our faith, with our families, with our fitness, and with our finances. But I love how you said in your word that you've given us your Holy Spirit to give us the power to accomplish these things. Jesus, we love you. Amen, amen, amen. Well, if you pray with me, there's some information coming on screen uh, that allows us to connect on a, on a deeper level than just you saying the prayer and going on. I would like to know if you prayed with us today. You can text me at 770-667-4899. Again, it's 770-667-4899. And I'd love to follow up with you and just further walk alongside you to make sure that these basic principles of the word are rooted and they are just rich inside of your life. Uh, today, as we transition now from the word into receiving today's offering, uh, I really want to encourage everyone, as the word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, uh, let each person as they purpose in their heart. And this is something that I encourage myself from time to time is to not get caught in just doing the routine or being on autopilot. But every time it's time for me to give, having a moment where I say, all right, Lord, what is it you would like me to sow and to share on today? And one thing that it does, is it helps for you to cultivate a sign of faith. But it also demonstrates that, Lord, the resources that I have, they belong to you. I'm just a steward of those resources. And I want us, even in these times, to not forget who was the one who gave us the power to get wealth. And as you uh, participate in giving today, there are three ways to uh, sow into the Outlet Community Church. Uh, there's text to give by texting the letters TOC to the number 73256. Uh, you can give online at theoutletcommunity.com slash give. Or you can Zelle us, which is just a, a transaction from bank to bank uh, through the number 770-865-5605 uh, or by email, which is give at theoutletcommunity.com. You know, in my first couple years as pastor, I was really timid around the topic of money because I didn't want you all to think that that's what we were out to get and that's what we were out to do. Um, and so I trusted the Lord and uh, you all were faithful concerning your giving. But what I have been noticing is that we have a lot of new members and those who have just joined the outlet community. So I wanted to communicate the heart behind giving. And one day the Lord chastised me for not speaking more directly concerning our finances. 
I noticed that people who were really open to what God was asking them to do concerning their giving, their lives were just going to another level. And he said that if you want everyone to experience the same level of fulfillment that those who are really vested with their hearts concerning their giving, then you need to talk about it and you need to be direct with it. And so I'm saying that during these times of giving, it's a form of worship. It's a form of just getting free from your heart concerning giving. But we're not doing this because we're in a financial pinch. We're doing this, number one, so that fruit may abound to your account. You're just going to see your life come up. But number two, y'all, we've got work to do. And we've got communities to impact. And I believe that we have what we need inside of our community. And so I went a little bit longer on offering today, but I want to let you know that not only are we communicating about giving, we have a responsibility as a church to now empower you financially and teach you things that you otherwise might not have even been taught in a uh, business education to make sure that you're utilizing the gospel and the kingdom to help further the mission of God through what he's calling you to do. But when we all come together, we all can do something special in our community. So, amen, amen, amen. Um, I want to remind you all that in a couple of weeks, we are going to have opportunities for us to get back together in person. And so, as you heard Diana say, on April 24th, we have our uh, Adopt a Block outreach event for those who are ready to just get out and do the work of the ministry on Saturday, April 24th. Uh, there's some more information that's coming up on screen for you to get involved there. Also, for those who want to uh, just hear the word in person. And so we're, we're going live on Sunday morning. And so if you want to hear the word in person, uh, you can RSVP your space uh, as we will be sharing the word of God as we open things up before. They fill up pretty fast. So you want to make sure you hop in on that as soon as you can. We will examine all COVID-19 or enforce all COVID-19 safety protocols because your safety is of utmost importance. As always, we will be online ministering wherever you are in the world. We love you so much and can't wait to see you next time here at The Outlet. God bless.